and it'll uh it'll tr- it'll like look on YouTube for keywords from the lyrics to pull videos to to chop up. Uh, mine doesn't do that. It just picks videos at random from a directory I specify. But mm-hmm. here's a uh, here's a playlist of like uh, shit that I generated with it using just videos I had lying around. So, you know, it's just sort of just sort sort of you know mm-hmm. looks interesting. And then if I if I choose a thematic video source then it sort of in, you know potentially more interesting are we recording right so now so we are currently okay. recording yes so welcome uh i wasn't sure if we wanted to have a like official start point once conversation starts that like the intention is more podcast style of like now we're actually in the session because there always has to be this kind right. of like coming in period but i wanted to record it because you just click a button. You just record yeah, audio. Yeah, I mean, right? if we dis- if we decide that we don't want some of it, we can just edit that, edit it out later. I guess better to exactly. have more. Uh, and no, we are actually also recording camera at the moment. Um, once again, I don't think the intention is to permanently have video as a thing ever published with it. We'll get permissions from everyone that ever turns a camera on. But similarly, I can just set the source to include that. So for now, it is included. Um, but yeah, Anki, I appreciate your kind of like generated content vibes that I've seen around like the uh, the gray images with the red text has generated oh, yeah, yeah. really That's cool a... shit. And so yeah, similar just kind of like hearing you like you would generated the text, you've done like uh, recurrent neural nets before all this like fancier you know, AI shit has kind of come about, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, my background kind of comes out of, like, reading, in, in terms of AI shit, comes out of reading every uh, book on AI that I could get out of the library in the 90s, which <laughs> means that I was reading uh, as a kid in great detail all of the technical shit that was state of the art in AI in the eighties, all of which is like, you know, the complexity of that shit was, was largely down to um, not having the hardware to do certain things you wanted to do fast enough, kind of. Um, Mm -hmm. And so all the, all the hard parts were, were like optimization problems, not, optimization in the sense of optimizing for a goal, but optimization problems in the sense of uh, performance optimizations, that you had to be very tricky with it because you didn't have a lot of space and you didn't have a lot of cycles and you didn't have a lot of RAM and generally you didn't have a lot of data either. Um, Now, I I mean, Moore's law has ended. We're no longer having we're no longer having exponential growth or even geometric growth particularly. Um, But we are still having growth, but like as of, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, anything that was state of the art in the eighties, you could like a bad programmer, uh, if they, if they spend a bit of time could implement a, a naive version that would work pretty well. And that includes, that includes neural nets. Uh, so, so the, so um, backpropagation, which is one of the the key things in neural net learning, was officially invented in the early '90s, and that was sort of why we had a big. That's why we had a bunch of hype around neural nets in the '90s, and that's also why we had um, uh, a certain number of like consumer products that were based on neural nets in the '90s. Um, not not terribly many, but but like there's stuff that that you could do. Um, but at the same time, like backpropagation is just a formalization of um, a, a kind of common sense thing that a lot of people, when they're working with neural nets, would kind of independently half reinvent. And so you can read 
books on neural nets from from before back propagation was invented and they would be describing something that would be very similar to back backprop sort of a roundabout but basically i have a lot of respect for for the old techniques because i've i've seen the hype cycle around the new techniques uh and i've also seen the performance ver like like the the I've seen the the uh, the the differences between how much how bloated something is and how effective it is in terms of the old techniques and the new techniques, and it's like, yeah, if if um, if, you, if you're Google, right, and you have no problem buying a thousand extra computers, then it makes perfect sense for you to. Uh, be using certain, you know, LLMs and things. Uh, if you're not Google, I'm not convinced that you want to use LLMs for uh, uses a little bit. Maybe uses not the right word because right now um, everybody's doing a kind of freemium model, uh, and so most people are are not paying for uh, the resources that are being used. Uh, if you are somebody who would be paying for the resources to use an LLM, you probably wouldn't want to as an in individual person because it's not going to give you that much over another technique like Markov models. You're saying uh, reject modernity and um, embrace tradition. I'm not necessarily saying that. <laughs> I I'm, I'm saying something adjacent which is um study history so that you don't reinvent a square wheel that's sort of what one I'm idea saying. i was reminded of as we're talking about this is the uh called the bitter lesson which is that techniques that have a lot more kind of like human intuition or algorithms that are kind of like tuned to use tricks relating to the medium or the information or anything like that are just not going to be as good as just brute force compute long term. And it's as as you were saying that you know used to be that compute was the bottleneck that we couldn't we had to be efficient with our with our implementations. And then graphics cards happened and just blew the fucking doors off of anything about compute. And so now, like, is, is anything, does it, does it care about efficiency? Nope. But oh boy, like, you feed it tens and hundreds of thousands of hours of compute time, and it starts to make these things that are just emerging in really beautiful ways. Well, you can do that, but you can... I, I think in many ways we've gone too far in that direction. Uh, and again, it's not it's not um, it's not like an older is better, newer is newer is worse kind of thing. It's more it, it's more that people don't are, are making decisions based on a, a kind of um, a, a warped understanding of of how the, the landscape changes over time because they're not really studying history uh, and and not in in so. So I, I work in an industry where where um, I am processing large amounts of data all the time, and in some sometimes we're doing things that are very much well that are technically machine learning. We're not generally using the the currently trendy algorithms, but like we are processing huge amounts of text in semantic ways, right? And we kind of have several different units this is no longer really true but but when i first started we had sort of several different units that were geographically separated and were culturally separated and i happened to land in the unit of all 80s unix guys who were very interested in performance and so they spent a lot of time uh trying to figure out how to do things performantly enough for their own tastes uh, and and we sort of discovered, oh, you don't actually need to do very much 
to get really good performance out of certain kinds of things. You don't really need graphics cards as long as you use pipelining correctly and, and multiprocessing correctly. Uh, in fact, graphics cards have, have downsides um, because graphics cards can't do branching. And so anything that's branching heavy it is not going to benefit from, from the parallelization that graphics cards do. Um, so our unit would, would implement something and it would be like 30 lines of Perl, right? And then we would discover that our sister unit that was three times as big, where everybody was paid twice as much, was doing exactly the same thing. And it was taking them 10 times as long on half the data. And they were using uh, a, a cluster of 40 machines and Hadoop and 8,000 lines of Java code, right? It, it was just, the, the difference was like when you're deciding how to do something, did you incorporate, let's not do this in, a, in an unnecessarily unperformant way into your um, analysis? Or did you focus on other factors that may not be uh, useful, like um, what does my team, what technologies does my team already know, and what are the currently popular technologies? Those two things are not are not really all that uh, important generally, because somebody can can learn enough of a new technology in a, a fairly rapidly to put something together and then once they've put something together they can they're, they're on their way to being proficient in it um so it's like uh so graphics cards are are another great example there's um there's a, a simple optimization the the a star uh pathfinding algorithm this is an algorithm that that every computer science student uh, is required to learn, generally speaking. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a part of most CS program curriculums, um, it, but it's buried in a in a course. It's all generic algorithms, and a lot of them are pathfinding. Turns out that if you implement it again, and you have it in, rather than rather than picking things at at rant, picking choices at random because again any neural net is kind of um kind of like a uh uh markov chain monte carlo in in that you have a, a bunch of nodes and you're kind of choosing with a certain amount of randomness but not with a hundred percent randomness which node to go to from another node and you're choosing based on the weights if you do that with the a star algorithm it's way faster than doing it linearly. Um, but if you do it with graphics cards, you have to do it linearly because the A star algorithm requires a lot of branching. But the funny thing is, the existing GANs, if you if you modify their, their thing to use A star, it's actually faster to do it in a single thread on the CPU than it is to use your entire graphics card to the point that people were like generating GANs on Arduinos. I mean, I, they weren't, they, they couldn't, they, they weren't storing the model on the Arduino, but all the processing was happening on the Arduino. That's like a, that's like a big deal because an Arduino is slow by the standards of mid eighties home PCs. What I'm saying is that they're really low hanging fruits that that people can pick up and and make all sorts of things much faster, much easier, much more environmentally friendly. And they don't because it requires them to learn things that nobody is asking them to learn. So what what's what's the first step if like you're somebody who wants to get into all of this and like you know maybe you you've i don't know yeah what, what like what's the first step if somebody wants to kind of get on that kind of path what kind of path are are you thinking of are you thinking of like 
using these using say an existing system that somebody else wrote to to uh to you to to generate stuff from machine learning are you thinking you know i want to understand some of these techniques enough to use them myself or what so i guess this for me it's like yeah like um uh, like Nancy was saying before, talking about your uh, it was uh, is it the Barbara Hollitzer series, where you have uh, the images auto generated with uh, the like that Barbara Kruger style J- Jenny Jenny Hollitzer is that it right? Yes, yeah. The the um, um, the, the original that, set of slogans was from Jenny Hollitzer. Yeah, and so okay, and like I wouldn't. I wouldn't know where to start on something like that, but you know, I've played around with you know, chat GPT and whatever and, and very, very low level, simple stuff. Um, I, like I wouldn't know where to begin being like, Oh, I want to make something that does such and such. Like I wouldn't even, I wouldn't know where to start. Like where would, where would I, someone like me start if I was just getting interested in like doing sort of generative stuff for the first time? Like I don't, I don't even know what my starting point would be. So, um, yeah, I, probably... can give, I can give some input on that too. Okay. Um, yeah, like, why don't you go first? The, the, the beauty of these modern algorithms that are doing, you know, this like heavy compute and all that is generality. Like, that's what we got. Like, Enki is definitely right that. You, like there is more efficient ways to be doing a lot of this stuff, but I'm also going to put a strong emphasis on like it sounds like Enki, you're working with like you said the '80s Unix guys. Like these are the sharpest tools in the shed, effectively. Um, it's yeah, the the core mastery of some of this stuff is unprecedented in some of those types, but it's like you can like a place to start. ChatGPT is. Certainly, everyone has interacted with it, but um, OpenAI also has their playground where you can go and generate text that doesn't have this like ChatGPT as politician. Um, and from there, they have um, API endpoints that then you can start interacting with through JavaScript and all that. Um, you can do pre training on certain things if you want to create your own language model out of like your own data set. And these things like it can take a half hour because you need to structure your data into like query response and then run a single command on the terminal. Like I'd probably say that because you know the, the easiest entry point is always going to be use someone else's stuff. Um, elsewise, places like Hugging Face they have cutting edge models that if you look closely, you can find stuff that runs on consumer hardware, but it is definitely true that a lot of this stuff requires some chunky hardware. But yeah. So I'm, I'm going to um, go kind of to the opposite end, which is um, if, if you want to under get, get a feel for some of the mechanics of this stuff get a feel for okay um if i'm going to use this algorithm how much data do i need and uh, you know what is what are the what does good output look like versus what does bad output look like and you know what kind of what kind of output means what about the data that i'm putting in and and also want it you want to get you know, an understanding of, of how to start out going about coding this stuff. Uh, Markov models is where I would start. Uh, because if you can only program a little bit, which is to say, okay, you need, you know how to read and write text and you know how to do string split and you know how to do for loops and you know how to do lookup tables. Uh, you can you can implement a first order Markov model. You can implement a second order Markov model. You can you can do all sort. You can iteratively elaborate on your implementation, and you can do all sorts of very interesting uh, things with it. And I I probably spent years just doing different 
making up different variations on Markov models. They, they can produce interesting output with not a huge amount of text. They uh, continue to produce pretty interesting output with substantially more text, um, which is an important thing to know about because like any, any kind of machine learning system is capable, let me back up. Any machine learning system has a certain amount of data that it handles the best and anything above that, it tends to get wobbly and anything below that, it tends to get wobbly. And this is true of LLMs as well, but the difference with LLMs is that the minimum is way, 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 way above what even the maximum is for, for a regular Markov model. So I would start with Markov models or maybe even maybe even something simpler like like um just string substitution can do some interesting things. And I would also uh recommend joining and following the discussions in NanoGenmo. This is a, a thing that happens every year in November. Uh, it's been happening since 2013. It's a bunch of people who who come together uh, to write programs that write novels, novels, quote unquote. And so the the idea is that the goal is that you're trying to produce an interesting text. You're trying to produce a text that someone might want to read. And any yeah. any techniques are fair game. And so people are talking about how they're trying to make their text more interesting. It's a no National Novel Generating Month, which came out of National <laughs> Novel Writing Month, right? It's, it's theoretically run by uh, Darius Kazemi. Darius Kazemi, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, um, who is... Um, who's involved with a lot of other things. Like he wrote, he wrote the, um, if you're on Mastodon, he, he wrote one of the, the most popular documents explaining the Mastodon protocol. So he's an interesting guy. The people who do it are generally pretty cool. And there's a, there's a, a long history of conversations going on in those spaces because it's it's now going back 10 years. So we have, sort of have 10 years of people talking about what they're trying to do and what other people are trying to do and talking about their reasoning behind doing certain things. Uh, so one of the big things that for, for me, uh, one of the key things that came out of it, came out of discussions in that, in that group was the understanding that uh, human beings basically always interpret juxtapositions is meaningful and so if you don't know how to select something if you select it at random it's going to tend to be better than you'd expect it's going to be like people are going to think it's interesting more like, like more than half the time even if it's completely random so that like you were talking about the the uh, the Barbara Holzer thing, right? Uh, that's a great example of it's much less complicated than it really looks, and it's mostly random. Because what that system does, all it does, is I have uh, a list of slogans, and I have a directory with thousands of images that I've downloaded off the internet at some point. And all it does is take an image at random, I make it black and white, I take a slogan at random, and stick it on. Now, uh, graphics programming is is more complicated and annoying than it needs to be almost all the time. So uh, that's really the only reason I wouldn't rec recommend somebody who is not already doing this stuff to jump in on that end. Uh, just because it's like you, you're gonna you're gonna get frustrated probably because I got really frustrated doing the initial implementation and I'm a a a, a very experienced programmer. But 
the general rule is like if you if you uh, take a list of something interesting and take another list of something interesting and you stick them together in some way it'll the result will be more interesting than either of the lists to someone who is uh going at it with the right frame there are a lot of ideas that popped up in nano genmo don't take a lot of technical skill to implement but are 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 very powerful one variation on this that i thought was really interesting that came from oh god i've forgotten the name of the thing but but somebody was generating a, a travel guide i think it was lisa daly uh i think she was behind that project but it was basically you're generating a um kind of like italo calvino's invisible cities you're you're, you're creating a description of of places and so you have to have information about the architecture and information about the the way the people are and what do they eat and and you know all all different stuff and so she had this idea of okay well why don't we make sort of a tarot like system of correspondences and we don't expose it to the user no we're we're not we're not just going to dump that that system of correspondences but we're going to have an internal system of correspondences and so we'll have some number of suits and every suit will have like the the kind of shape that it likes and the kind of architecture it likes and whatever. So like one of the suits was eggs. And so the egg suit would have marble architecture and would have things painted white and would have, you know, uh, various other things. That that were kind of egg like, like like maybe they would eat a lot of eggs. Maybe they uh, would fashion fine china. Maybe that's their industry. And so basically, what 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 she would do is whenever she generated a, a new place, she would have like a proportion for each of the suits, and that would be uh, that that would bias the selection of attributes uh and when you do that uh it's very interesting because it, it kind of avoids the the um thousand bowls of oatmeal problem which is to say when you have um when you have a a generative system that is working off of um data set that is quite varied and it's it's selecting things completely at random uh and you're looking at the output, a lot of the output of the same thing, it tends to get a little bit samey because eventually you recognize, oh, I've seen this thing before. And it, you eventually catch on, oh, it's just being random. Uh, if, you, if you segment into sections that are thematically related tenuously, and you, you tend to select things from a section together, then all of a sudden you have a bunch of coherence. And as long as you don't always select something from the same section, as long as it's a mixture, people don't catch on. Instead, they uh, attribute uh, meaning to the juxtaposition of, of elements from different, from different conceptual sets. So like, that's not a technical idea. That's sort of a philosophical idea about what is interesting to people that's like a psych psychology insight but uh it's it's one of these key things that allows you to produce something automatically that is interesting to a person without the computer having to be as intelligent as a person yeah and that's what a lot of these things are yeah at one that somebody generated called infinite fight scene and it's exact it's got that exact problem like it seems to be quite coherent in terms of any given sentence is logical um but it is literally a fight scene that just runs forever and it's i would not sit down and read that for more than one minute i don't think anyone's ever read the whole thing yeah yeah, so yeah really exactly i did a um early on just using gpt i did like i prompted chapters with the start of um the, the stuff i actually wrote um like i prompted you use you know the start of each um chapter of eris of, of chasing eris um as like a prompt 
and it it made some really interesting stuff, and, and it was it kind of felt coherent to a point, apart from you know that it was, um, you know, different chapters would contradict each other because it's um, giving different information, it doesn't have any interest in consistency in, in terms of, of what it's telling us. But uh, then again, I, I think I might have you know started a new session for each chapter, so I don't know if that that played into that. And, and, yeah, he gave something that was a bit more interesting. It's still, I think nobody read it, and I think that's just because, you know, part of uh, being interested in a nonfiction novel is, or a nonfiction piece of writing is that it's going to tell you something that's worth knowing, whereas, um, you know, stuff that's just been made up by a robot maybe isn't, isn't worth knowing, um, quite frankly. I, I like that you mentioned Infinite Fight Scene because uh, Infinite Fight Scene is, is actually a great uh, illustration of that effect and also, there are kind of variations that are very similar that avoid that effect, uh, and so that it's a, it's a great way to illustrate how to how to try to avoid it. I, I won't say that they avoid it completely, but they avoid it uh, mostly. Uh, so uh, one example: somebody also did a so infinite fight scene. I believe actually came after this other example, but the other example was in French, so not as many people read it, but. Um, Basically, what they did is rather than generate actions of a fight scene, they just identified every sentence in a source text that involved fighting and isolated them and deleted everything else. Uh, and and so it, it, this at, this is easier in French because there's like one primary word for all forms of hitting. Uh, and so they just, I believe the source text was either the Aeneid or the Odyssey. I think it was probably the Aeneid. And so they just have, they they removed everything from the Aeneid that wasn't people hitting each other. And because there is more variation than there generally would have been in a generative model, uh, that tended to be more interesting. Uh, and then the other... The other example I would give is actually um, uh, a pair of similar projects that, that I did. Um, one, but both were based on media properties, uh, and both were based on what's called generative grammar, which is um, where you have a bunch of substitution rules. So, so you'll have a sentence, and and rather than having a certain word in one place, you'll have um some kind of code that points to another rule. And then that rule will have multiple choices and each choice may also contain references to other rules. And so it'll just, you, you construct the thing and to generate a sentence, every time it sees a rule, it'll look it up, choose a random one, and then it'll finish when it no longer has any references. So, that's sort of the same thing that infinite fight scene might have been implemented with. I don't recall whether or not they use it, but they use it, something conceptually sim similar. One of my things was was uh, simulating the voiceover monologue from the French New Wave movie last year at Marion Bad, and just using uh, variations. And then the other one was simulating it was like sort of writing a script for an episode of the the uh, 60s soap opera Dark Shadows. So the reason these two worked, and I, I will uh, confidently say that they did work because somebody paid me a hundred bucks for the rights to publish one of them. So the reason they, they work is that they present a thematic excuse for the um for the failures of the um underlying mechanism to actually impart part meaning uh because last year at marion bad is this slow repetitive dreamlike movie that is that is constantly hinting at things but is never actually saying things outright and it's always it, it's it's it feels like it doesn't just feel like a dream. It feels like one of those anxiety dreams that you might get if you drunk a bunch of coffee and then fell asleep. And so that that 
mood was reflected in the uh, voiceover, and I simulated that mood, and therefore it was reflected in my generated thing. And so you had this this hypnotic repetition, but it seemed very intentional, and it invited people to read into it. The same thing is kind of true of Dark Shadows, but Dark Shadows has an extra element, which is that it was a it was a daily soap opera in the sixties. Uh, so it had enormous amounts of padding, like events that take, you know, an afternoon will be six or seven episodes long. And you'll start off with a recap of the last episode, and then you'll end with a preview of the next one. And in between will be two people uh, talking mysteriously at each other about something the viewer hasn't found out yet in order to fill time. And every character is suspicious of every other character. Uh, and therefore, they're, they're being circumspect, you know, canonically. There, there's, there's a justification in story for them being circumspect. Basically, if you have a, if you have a reason why somebody reading it might want to give it the benefit of the doubt, people are going to do that. And things like style clues are, are a real key to that. So that's also part of why the the uh, Barbara Holzer thing works is that um, Barbara Holzer and uh, sorry sorry Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer are both conceptual artists who already work with juxtapositions, and so there's a frame for interpreting their juxtapositions, and people who see them even if they don't recognize the artists by name are recognizing oh this is that kind of uh, that kind of art where you're supposed to read into it. It, it, it remi- makes me, what, what I'm thinking of, uh, and this is just changing it a little bit, is um, there was that period there before, like, chat GPT came out where um, every so often people would, like, write essentially AI scripts and would just lie about it, basically, um, but would say, oh, I fed, I fed 100 hours of KFC commercials and uh, this is what my robot made. And then it was always like, the people pick up the chicken. The chicken is so delicious. They must have the chicken. They burn down the parliament. They kill the president. Chicken, chicken, they yell. And it's like, it's funny because like you read them now and I think it's like, it's obviously not. Like, it's obviously like, you know, Penguin of Doom type, you know, just human input. But yeah, I don't know it's just, it just amused me for a moment that that we went through that period where we kind of didn't know what you know we had this very uh, very specific idea of what like computer generated output looks like, uh, which is nothing that resembles anything that computers are actually kind of uh, generating. So there's actually an interesting story about that because the initial. So the origin of that meme actually was partially computer generated. It was from a, a kind of, I guess they're a comedy collective. I've now forgotten their name and I'm, it's going to bug me because I was like, I was on their, their Slack and I was like, I was kind of a member of their community. So they, they are actually, um, yeah, the the stuff that was coming out of other people other than the people who were involved in that really generally was fake, but but those people actually were were using a, a first order Markov model, but it was it was actually implemented along the lines of autocomplete, like a phone keyboard. Uh, and this is actually pretty simple to do. Um, I have a, I wrote a program to do the same thing because I didn't really like theirs. Um, and so when somebody says, oh, a thousand hours of Arby's commercials, what that actually means is that they've taken the scripts of the equivalent of a thousand hours worth of Arby commercials, and they've split it by white space, um, or they've split it by by non-alphanumeric characters basically like so you have a you have words and you have the order in which the words go and they would present they, they'd have a, a sort of a text editor window where you could type and any if you if you had 
if you press space, it would take the last word you typed. It would look it up in the list of, of everything that was in the training data, which would be the Arby's commercial scripts, right? And if it found an ins if it found the word, right, it would find the the nine most common th words that came after that word. And it would show nine options. And you click on one of the nine options or you'd type your own word, right? And so that is machine learning in the sense that it learned the frequency associations between these words. And in fact, you can you can do it without the human loop. And what you what you do is basically say, you know, I'm going to pick one of these nine at random, but I'm going to do it proportionally to how common they are with respect to each other. And that, that would just be a Markov model. That's just a Markov chain. Uh, if you, if you put the human in the loop, it's, it's a, um, it's an autocomplete system. So it turns out that if you have very specifically constrained text corpora, you, you get a, a, a big boost in, in simulating the, the feel of, you know, the voice being used in, in that uh, text input, right? You can really get the tone and sound like an Arby's commercial. But then also because Markov models don't model as much, right? They're, they're only concerned with this word came after that word and they generally, so, so a first order Markov model is just concerned with pairs of words. Uh, and doesn't know anything about any of the other context. And therefore, it will also make funny mistakes that sounds sound like sort of Penguin of Doom shit. And those will be suggestions, right? So the reason why those things sounded the way they did is that the first ones were literally comedy writers using Markov models and often picking the funniest uh, choice that was presented to them and uh, writing something of their own if none of the choices were funny. Yeah, okay, that, that makes a bit of sense. Oh, they're called Botnik. That's, that's the name that they, they call themselves. So I think they're still around if, if you Google Botnik, B-O-T-N-I-K. But they're, like, they're, I guess, originally, like, their roots are in improv or something, which sort of also makes sense. Um, a few other people uh, I know that are on the call. Did anybody else sort of want to jump in with some uh, AI hot takes or anything like that? <laughs> right, I'm getting getting flashbacks to uh, when I'm in a classroom and I'm asking if anybody has any thoughts. <laughs> Anyone, Bueller? I was I was I didn't glaze over listening to all that, but that was way above my my head. I, I grasped a little bit, but I while I was in the middle of that. While you guys were in the middle of that, I, I looked up on Chat GPT of uh, how, what's the ten simple ways to get coins with holes in them into the into the coin circulation system, and it could not assist with that. So it's just it's, it's been instructed not to aid in felonies. <laughs> Is that a felony? Defacing currency? Yeah, I mean it's not enforced, but yeah, technically it's a felony. <laughs> I think Don't if worry, you, uh, it's one of the ones we how, all do. How, how to scale up the operation of doing that? Then you might get some heat on you. But yeah, well, it, it's it's one of the. It, it's really funny because um, the the aquarium near me always used to have a machine where you'd put in a penny and a quarter, and then it would stretch out the penny and make it completely useless. That. Uh, that aquarium was was government funded, and yet, like, it's charging people a quarter to commit a felony. <laughs> yeah, I'm holding here a, a science center one of the same, my because that's where my thoughts went too. If you can deface it by putting a stamp on it, then you know, then everything's then all of this is an art project, and especially with coins, nobody's going to enforce you know, a handful of pennies inside of a parking meter. I had this idea, uh, and I don't really have the chops to do it or the connections to do it, um, but I, 
I think it would be really cool to do, which is you make a vending machine. And this is sort of a art project thing. This would be at home at Burning Man, I think. Although I guess you don't take money to Burning Man, so it won't work there. But that kind of vibe. Uh, basically, it's a, where it's a vending machine and you put in a dollar and there's a clear window and it will take your dollar and it'll set it on fire in front of you. Uh, and, and I mean, it'll lose money, but like the point is that it's going to make a spectacle out of destroying money. I think that would be that's, that's pretty delightful. Cool. There's like a church of burn and the money burning guy and, and those people who are all like, Oh, like burning money is a sacrament because it's, it's one of the, in a modern society, it's one of the only things that can really give most people this kind of frisian that's necessary for like left hand tantric type shit. Like the only thing that'll really like knock you on your ass emotionally without harming you physically is like burning a $20 bill. I'm not sure if that's really true. Uh, certainly, like, I think most people would not be super shocked in the way that people would have been in, in the 17th century at, like, treading on or spitting on a cross. So, like, there, there are a limited number of things that you can do for, like, that part of that kind of initiation where you're really supposed to like be in an altered state because you feel like you've lost something. Not about the money. It's about sending a message. That, uh, that feels totally up Waterloo, your alley. Honestly, like when I think about your projects of creating opportunities for unique experience and inviting people into this space, like, I like that someone did the same thing, but put it into like a vending machine <laughs> effectively. Um, it was like, Hey, here, here's an opportunity to burn your own money. Yeah. I, I don't think that anybody actually has done a money burning vending machine. I just, you know, conceptually yeah. it makes sense to do it. And if it was done at burning man, then it's such, it's a, even more of a novelty because nobody brought cash. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I mean that's the that's the issue is, and like I would kind of want it to you know check to to have a regular you know money reader right to to actually check that your dollar bill was a real dollar bill because like it would sort of be a waste if people just use it to burn pieces of paper. I was gonna say, has anyone here um, done like money money burning ritual or? I have. I have. I didn't get what I thought I was going to get out of it. It made me a little jittery, but it didn't really, um, like, hit my brain. But I may have not burnt enough compared to the amount of money I have, because part of the thing is that you have to it has to feel like a lot and I'm a cheapskate. So like my sense of what feels like a lot is actually substantially lower than what I can actually afford. So uh, that's probably why. Yeah. It's uh, John, John Harris, uh, money burning guy says that's uh, it should be enough that it hurts a little. <laughs> this is like very tangential, but Something I would like to execute in my life is a regular donation to nonprofits, effectively. Um, just one of those kind of acknowledgments of like, damn, I've got a really privileged life. Like, effectively, I'm not going to have to worry about where my food is coming from. You know, for us, like, I have a college degree. It gives me enough stability. And it's kind of this acknowledgement of responsibility to give back in some form you know, it's like i'm certainly not fucking one percent but global one percent maybe i am 
and it, and yet it's one of those one things where I've been working professionally for at least two three years now I haven't gone out of my way to start donating like the the 10 percent of my income sort of thing because like oh but I always I always just need a little bit more right now <laughs> and it's just one of those funny things where I recognize like yeah I bet it's always going to feel like that like that's kind of the structuring our, of our society that it's never going to feel like enough and I'm always going to feel like I could just use a little bit more like this money now will help me make more money later but you know part of the practice is recognizing like oh like if this is this is just kind of in my own perception of it that other people are getting by with much less but yeah i've started absolutely i've started thinking about oh, I, I i donate to people on the street corner um often and mm -hmm. i started to feel like there's an effect that comes from it so now i'm just riding high and you know when i was giving out five dollars that felt pretty good and especially when my kids are in the car or somebody's watching like hey look this we can all do this and uh you know propaganda of the deed um but a few weeks ago i wa i drove by a guy and i gave him a dollar and he swore at me he just shook the dollar he was like a fucking dollar and it was just like shaking his hand at me and i was like oh damn it so then two weeks later, driving by again, I got a 10 out, and I put that in his, and then he was, he was totally elated. And I use those moments to, uh, to alter my state of consciousness by connecting. Just here, this, this is flowing from somewhere to this guy. It's going to flow somewhere else. I don't know where it goes, but you know, I'm part of this flow of capital. And uh, you know, thinking that way is fun in my brain yeah to help somebody I, i've got um small standing monthly donations to um uh project gutenberg um uh uh wikipedia um the that online etymology lookup service it's like run by one guy um i've forgotten what it's called etymol nine i guess and a couple other things that are sort of related to uh, making sure certain information remains available. And I'm, I'm thinking of, of starting to, to um, open that up and, and start sending small amounts of money sort of automatically to organizations that are, that are doing more concrete things like food banks and stuff. The the one thing that I'm concerned about is that did I lose you? Or is that just Anki? <laughs> I can hear you. Can't hear anything. Yeah. The one thing he's concerned about is that <laughs> the they one thing I'm him. concerned of. And they, they will prevent him. They will take him off Discord <laughs> and move him fast before he that says these words. That one day it'll all just end. That one day it's just blackness. Yeah. <laughs> pretty good <laughs> um right now uh, i checked my patreon i'm currently donating to philosophy tube felix Colgrave, the queer armorer and robert miles so we've got philly animations ai safety trans philosophy and queer weapons so I, I really have been appreciating Patreon a lot. I think it's just a, like, I can, I see a thing. I say, this guy's animations are fucking fantastic. They give me a giggle. I would like that to happen more in the world. You know, I want this guy to have the ability to work on his passion project more so than, so, so it's, it's nice that there is that direct thing there. Just Brian, like, can you tell us about uh, Patreon? What it looks on the other looks like on the other end. Me or uh, I think Dingo also could talk about that. I was talking to Clutterbuck. Ah, uh, yeah, it, it, it's uh, it, like it's pretty good. Um, look, it, honestly, like in in terms of visuals, they just kind of you just kind of um, filter through uh, uh, patron account versus. Um, you know, 
creator account and, and they both they basically look identical they, they pretty much look exactly the same but um like it's, it's pretty good it's got a range of tools um i i really like it i was about to say that you know i feel like i'm a bad um, patreon user because i don't uh at, at the moment just we're uh, we're finishing up uh with a kind of a big project that's that's been quite um quite consuming uh, but when that's sort of over with i, I do want to you know, kind of uh, pay for a few more people's projects because I think that you know, a lot of stuff goes on that's really cool. And, and um, I, you know, like I said, I, I benefit from Patreon uh, by, you know, people people signing up to me. And, but I don't give out to too many. So I know that all I'm giving out to is Asset Horizon um, and that's because they've got these um, uh, reading groups. Um, so they've they I was going to just stay on for um, a thousand plateaus and then they've gone on with um, Nietzsche and philosophy and I was like oh well I should join those when I can so I'm still sort of uh, hooked up to their wagon until they they sort of stop those reading groups um, but yeah it, it, I don't know like do you have any particular questions it's it's just it's it, like it's pretty straightforward like it's quite intuitive I would say. Um, it it looks you. a lot like Facebook. It's just sort of a timeline where you can you can post, and there's just sort of like a a, a I guess it's a drop down or something where you select, you know, is this for everybody or is this for only subscribers or do people have to you know be a a subscriber of a particular tier to see this? Okay. Well, uh, how much of that dollar that I give or whatever it is. Go, it gets to you. What you know? What percentage gets to the? I don't remember. Uh, is it? Is it like? Is it like? Um, do they take like thirty percent or something? I've forgotten so, how much they take. I, I thought it was a little bit less, but um, they definitely take. They definitely take a cut. I was going to say. I think this has gone for about an hour. Do we want to kind of start to wind down? Or sorry, I wasn't there at the very start. We kind of started early, anyway. So. <laughs> I can continue to chat as long as people want to chat. Well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna um, check out anyway, and and then I'll uh, I'll just whatever. Uh, I think uh, uh, Nothi's recording, so uh, mm -hmm. whoever wants you know, whoever's gonna get into the, that. And uh, congratulations on um, we've started something. So woo! Yeah. Woo! It's a it's a nice it's a nice project that. I'm kind of interested to see it branch out, like kind of more of it as like a platform for members, arts and creations. I think it's really what kind of captured my imagination about it. So yeah, it's nice to have, you know, the first like major one where we sat down, we said, hey, let's do a thing and it happened. So hmm. you know, certain, certainly something magic in there. Do we want to do the Deleuze Q&A next week? Or do we want to do it like at a different time or, or what? Because I feel like that could be um, I feel like that could be a, a, a sort of a useful thing to do. I'm sure lots of people are kind of looking for Deleuze explainers. <laughs> next next week's uh, next week's good. That that suits me fine, especially since it's an off week for for Deleuze, so we can always just um, put out the usual time and and those who who need extra Deleuze in their life can. Can join up for that, or we can we can do it this time or, or the usual time, either one. I'll be missing that one. I'm busy next weekend. I'll be out in the woods. All right. Well, uh, we'll continue to uh, to plan it in the in the back channels, maybe. Sounds good. Right. Thank you all for being here. Glad for glad for this community. Thank you. Right on. I'll pop in at eight. See y'all. See y'all. See you. Well, if if people are leaving, I'll just I'll just leave. Okay. I'll okay. see you later. <laughs>